I suppose. One is uh, for at least one person here who didn't know what the word Australasia meant. It's a word that is simply describing Australia and New Zealand. That's the collective name for those two now, two separate countries. The other thing is that last week we talked about what is the gospel of the kingdom. And I don't have time, and, and you wouldn't want me to take the time, I don't think, to go over all that again. But I will just show you one slide that we looked at last time. First of all, this comment by a Dr Marshall who said that it is universally agreed by New Testament scholars that the central theme of the teaching of Jesus was the kingdom of God. That's quite a significant statement from someone who isn't of our community. But it's a, a simply a statement of fact. It's acknowledging that is the dominant theme of the New Testament. Whether even sometimes we realise that or not is an interesting question we can discuss later, perhaps, if you want to. But that's why we're dealing with this subject over two nights. The other comment here, which I had last time as well, is on the use of the word Christ. In Christian usage, Christ first, after the New Testament time, first acquired a new and different meaning and then lost all meaning and became simply a name like Jesus itself. And we could sometimes fall into that little trap, I suppose, and just use the term Jesus Christ in a fairly offhand way of, well, that's his name, but it's not his name. His name is Jesus, full stop. Christ is a title equivalent to the Hebrew Messiah. And perhaps sometimes we forget that and we just miss the point of that term, Christ, in the New Testament. It's a very loaded word, as is Jesus, of course, in another sense. And then a fairly well-known comment, I think, from the famous historian Edward Gibbon. The doctrine of Christ's reign upon earth was at first treated as a profound allegory, was considered by degrees as a doubtful and useless opinion, and was at length rejected as the absurd invention of heresy and fanaticism. And for some reason, we've lost our screen. If Steve can hear me say that. I'm wondering if it's a loose cable. Yes, it might have been. All right. Well, what happened then? If the whole idea of the gospel of the kingdom had been lost... How come is it that we now know what it is? Well, we've probably all heard of the term the Reformation, which started with Martin Luther in 1517. But he didn't teach the gospel of the kingdom. So we have to go a little bit further along. And to try and make it reasonably concise tonight, I'm only going to look at a very few examples of how the idea or the understanding of the gospel of the kingdom was restored. And the 1660 statement of beliefs by the Baptists in England is very significant. Let's, it, first of all, it was signed by 40 men, so you know, it was quite a well-thought-out idea and presented to authorities. It didn't go down very well. Most people thought it was quite wrong or irrelevant but nevertheless from our point of view it's really interesting because all of the points which you'll see in this statement we would agree with 100 percent when christ who is our life shall appear we shall also appear with him in glory from colossians 3 for then shall he be the king of kings and lord of lords revelation 19 for the kingdom note the old spelling of a few words here the kingdom is his and he is the governor among the nations from Psalm 22 and king over all the earth from Zechariah 14 and we shall reign with him on the earth, Revelation 5. 
the kingdoms of this world, which men so mightily strive after here to enjoy, shall become the kingdoms of our Lord and his Christ in Revelation 11. There's a little bit more yet, but just before I turn over the next slide, notice, as we understand too, the emphasis on the earthly nature of the kingdom, not a heaven one. So this is a significant departure from nearly all Christians at that time. For all is yours, O ye that overcome this world, for ye are Christ's, and Christ is God's. 1 Corinthians 3. It's a bit slow turning over, isn't it? Hmm, not sure why. Again, Steve, we're having a little hiccup. We're catching up. It's, it's gone on to the next one. Fine. For unto the saints shall be given the kingdom and the greatness of the kingdom under, and the, this is their words, mark that, under the whole heaven. In other words, on earth. Hmm. We keep losing the picture, Steve. I'll try moving this over. It's caught. If that helps a little. No picture, Steve, yet. There we go. That's very loose, that connection, I think. Okay, let's keep going. I hope for the best. There we go. Though, alas, now many men be scarce content that the saints should have so much as, as being among them, but when Christ shall appear, then shall be their day, then shall be given unto them the power over the nations to rule them with a rod of iron. Steve, I've got a hunch that it's the plug yeah. in here that's a little loose. So I moved it over and hopefully it'll stay there. Yeah, you can shift that around here. Yeah. Yeah. All right, we'll keep plodding along. Hopefully we'll get, get through it all right. And the last point, they shall receive a crown of life which no man shall take from them, nor they by any means turn or overturn from it, for the oppressor shall be broken in pieces. So with those two slides you can see that although they're largely quotations, the point that they're trying to make is that the kingdom will not exist until Christ returns and establishes that kingdom on earth. We're very familiar with that, but in 1660, that was very radical teaching and that didn't go down well with the main churches, particularly Church of England at that time. But there's too much uh, to possibly go into any more detail or connections with other groups. But just moving along, there's a couple of examples of some interesting publications, um, 1796 and 1807. The one on the left says, um, Sentiments concerning the kingdom and Christ, the coming and kingdom of Christ. And the other one on the right is the whole world governed by a Jew as the government of the second Adam and king and priest and so on. They had very long titles back then. Uh, early Christadelphians weren't unique in that regard. Um, but they they are publications. This is before the time of Brother Thomas. Um, there were people starting to realise that the Bible did in fact talk about the gospel of the kingdom and that it's a kingdom on earth. So here's a third one. This one's in, published in Scotland. When it comes up, I'll start reading it. It's called a, a, a publication dealing with the Redeemer's speedy return, personal return and reign on earth with his glorified saints during the millennium, Israel's restoration to Palestine. So you can see now it's getting even more detailed people were really starting to understand their Bibles much, much better. And this is the time when 
what we now call Christadelphians, began to arise. So Brother Thomas was by no means the first person to discover these things, but unfortunately these individuals and many others um, sort of blossomed for a little while and then faded out of, out of uh, circulation for one reason or another. Again, we can't go into any of that. Then we come to Brother Thomas, um, who lived from 1805 to 1871, and he began his search for what he called the true way to immortality in 1832 at the age of 27, following his near shipwreck in the Atlantic Ocean off Nova Scotia in Canada. This search took 14 years and his understanding developed in four stages, which I'll show you in a moment. But just try and imagine if you can, now you'd never understood anything in the Bible, perhaps never even read it. Um, somebody gives you a Bible and says, off you go, try and figure out what it's all about on your own. No group to discuss it with, no existing material to just read and say, oh, that's fine, I, I agree with all that from nothing, basically, to try and put together a whole structure of our beliefs would take me probably a lot longer than 14 years. That's an enormous task. And it's no surprise it took him that long. But I, I've identified what I have described there as the four main steps that he went through. The first one was the importance of Bible study, Bible knowledge, rather than picking up what some theologian or some church has published, read the Bible for yourself, which incidentally was one of Martin Luther's catchphrases. He used the, the Latin term sola scriptura, which literally is only Bible, or as we would say it, only the Bible. That's the only thing we're going to have regard to. And he got that very clearly to start with very quickly realised that to be truly baptised for the forgiveness of sins and the hope of eternal life, you needed to be a, an adult or at least a, a quite mature young person because you needed to know what this gospel is all about. Otherwise, just simply going underwater, people do that thousands of times especially if they like swimming or diving or scuba diving or whatever, they're immersed many, many times, but that's not baptism. It needs to be coupled with a knowledge of the gospel. That got him into trouble because the Baptists in America at this time didn't care what you believed. They just wanted you to get baptised or immersed. And he said, no, that's not enough. You need to know what you're doing. He then became aware as he kept reading his Bible that immortality is not something we're born with and it's not something we can just get at the request from wherever, from God or from the church or from anywhere else. It's only going to be provided when Christ comes back to the earth. Well, that was even more controversial. And lastly, that return would establish the kingdom on earth. All of that took 14 years. might seem really simple to us now, very easy, but it wasn't back then. I'd like to just show you the kind of thinking he went through, but just before that. Um, okay, from 1832 to 1843, that's 11 years, so he's still a little bit further to go. But from 1843 to 1847, when he was baptised, he really started to focus on this issue of the kingdom. So his first magazine was called The Herald of the Future Age, in other words, the kingdom. His second one was called Herald of the Kingdom and Age to Come, even more clear cut. That was clearly where he was going with his understanding. And he wrote one article which I think is really quite telling. He put it in the form of questions. Will not the faithful of all past dispensations be put in possession of Canaan, that's Israel today, Canaan in Asia, Asia meaning anywhere east of Europe, 
and of the government of men of all nations by a resurrection from the dead, and will not the faithful on the earth at that time undergo an instantaneous change from a state of, of mortality to one of incorruptibility? And will not all this be consequent or following on from the descent of Jesus to the Mount of Olives? Okay, it's a question, but it's pretty obvious that he actually is saying, I think that's right, prove me wrong. And that was really what he was doing. But it was politely or gently put in the form of a question. And here's the next one. Is not the subject of God's promise to Abraham synonymous with the kingdom of God and of Christ or the kingdom of God or the reign of God or my father's kingdom? And is, not, and is it not when Jesus enters on the possession of the land of Canaan that the apostles will sit upon 12 thrones judging the 12 tribes of the restored Israel that he will partake of that Passover which will be accomplished in the kingdom of God and he will drink of the product of the vine with the apostles new in his father's kingdom. That many will come from the east and west and will be placed at table with Abraham, Isaac and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven, etc. Again, it's a politely put in the form of a question but it's pretty obvious that's how he now understood it. He got a, a whole lot of criticism for that because it cut across the idea of going to heaven. It cut across the idea that you didn't need to know the details of the gospel to be baptised. You just had to believe that Jesus saves us and forgives us and that was it. And so he's cutting right across the popular understanding at this point. And just a little bit more um, on his development... Um, as you saw previously, he was baptised age 42. He was, he then, within a, about a year, travelled to Britain to preach. He thought that would be very beneficial. He was, whilst he was born in England, he was living in America. Um, the next year he wrote the book Elpis Israel. Note the word Israel in the title. He was again trying to make a, a clear point. And there's... Uh, copy of very early version of it. He then, as we saw before, started another, his second magazine called The Herald of the Kingdom and Age to Come. And that's the cover of that, which you can see online, incidentally. They're, they're all been conveniently put there, like so much else nowadays. But now we're going to move beyond that point. So he's been in, in Britain... 1848 through to 1850, about two and a half years. So what then happened? Well, the first ecclesia was established in 1849, while he was still in Britain, in Dundee, Scotland. And it's a, there's a significance of the fact that it was Scotland, as I'll make a bit clearer later. The second and third were also in Scotland, in 1850, Glasgow and Aberdeen. Then we move into England the following year in Nottingham. Then Birmingham, in, also in England, of course. Then Edinburgh in 1853. And what's significant about that is they thought, well, we ought to come up with a name for our group of believers. It was, this is about another 11 years before the name Christadelphian was thought of. So at this time, they called themselves baptised believers of the gospel of the kingdom. Again, note the terminology, the gospel of the kingdom. They got it, as we do. Um, but it's a little bit of a long-winded title, and so later on it was found more convenient to have one word rather than a whole lot of words. And the history of that group has been written. Again, you can read this online. The three volumes produced by William Norrie, that's the brother of Robert Roberts' wife, and he wrote it all up in 1902, I think, remember, and three and four, the three volumes, something like that, early 1900s anyway. And then for more ecclesias became established in 1854 in Halifax in England, 
then that same year in Scotland was the first combined meeting. I think there was only something like 20 there, but they, various ones came from those early ecclesias and all got together for the first time. And that was just fantastic. They felt really excited that now we've got believers in several places and it's just terrific to all get together. And they produced a magazine a little while later called The Messenger of the Churches. And that con continued for a few years. And then, as I mentioned, in 1864, the name Christadelphian was created. Well, that's simply background. I know it took a little while, but we now move to Australasia. Because Australasia as a pair of countries didn't exist as we know until 1788, not that much before this time. And in, in these early years, there were only a very few small settlements. So there weren't any of these believers in Australia until this time or later. And that's what we're going to see tonight. But we need to sort of think about where we are. Well, these baptised believers, of course, were up here in Britain. And we're talking down here, Australia and New Zealand. And that journey from there down here and across there through what's called the Roaring Forties, that took anything up to three months just to sail from there down to Australia. And because the winds in the south tended to be going that way, and you've got a sailing ship, you depend on the wind, they often went, kept going, and they went across the bottom of the Pacific Ocean, around Cape Horn and back that way. In other words, they didn't go back the way they came because there'd be headwind all the way, pretty much. Anyway, again, I've got to stop there because I could waffle on a lot about all of that. The <coughs> second thing to have in your mind is what was Australia like at this time? Well, it, it changed quite significantly over a period of time. So we started off in 1788. The only bit that we would call Australia was this eastern half. And it was all called New South Wales. It was 37 years later before Britain said, oh, well, we might as well have the rest as well and make it one big lump uh, with Tasmania, which, sorry, um, with Tasmania as Van Diemen's land at the time. So that's the first time, 1825, where it was all one country, if you like, separate colonies, but all, all British. And then progressively going down to 1836, South Australia was cut out of it. Not quite the shape it is today, but close to it. And then we go up to the top right-hand corner, Victoria is created in 1851. And then we're looking more familiar now, 1859. You'll note that Northern Territory is called New South Wales, simply meaning that they hadn't created it as a separate area yet, although physically separated from the rest of New South Wales. It's not until 1911 Federation where it was called Northern Territories and <coughs> it looks familiar. And a note over there, up until 1841, New Zealand was still part of New South Wales as a colony. So when we talk about the arrival of believers in the kingdom of God, they came at different times into quite a different country, if you like, than what we now are familiar with. So what was the way in which that belief of the gospel of the kingdom came to us? Australasia. First of all, as far as we can find, the first person from Britain was a Mr David Leishman in 1849. Now remember, 1849 was the year Elpis Israel was written. He had heard Brother Thomas lecture in Britain just a few months earlier. I can't say whether he was a brother or not because we don't have any information about whether he was baptised with this information or not 
But we do know that John Coghill, who followed her three years later, did. He's definitely a brother, as we would recognise today. So Victoria was the first part of this whole region to have someone from Britain, with our beliefs, land. But he was on his own, because David Leishman died just after John Coghill arrived. So there wasn't much connection between them. So for quite a long time, John Coghill was, as far as he knew and as far as we know, the only brother in the whole of Australasia. That would be a bit of a, a bit of a scary thought, I think, for any of us. Imagine travelling halfway around the world in a country that barely been opened up at all and you're the only one. But it's clear that he kept the faith, as we'll see. Very, very soon after he arrived, New Zealand had a brother turn up, name of Samuel George Hayes from London. Um, he went to New Zealand. And similarly, he was the only one there for quite a while. And that would have been a challenge. But we'll see he kept the faith too, quite significantly for both those brethren. Next, we come across the first brother in Queensland, Robert Sinclair from Scotland, 1861, and Philemon Coley from Birmingham. Uh, if you talk to some of the long-standing families in, in Queensland, they all know that name. Uh, if you said to them, uh, you know, you'd read something about Philemon Coley, they'd go, oh, right, did you know that? And they'll tell you all about his life. He's quite a well-known <coughs> early brother. New South Wales was next, and in that same brother, Sinclair, I'm pretty sure it's the same one, um, be coincidence if it's not. He'd moved to Scott to New Zealand and he came over to New South Wales and baptised two brethren in Sydney, 1864. Then finally we get to South Australia. A brother, a George Scott Murray from New Zealand came over in 1878 to Goolwa and we'll say a bit more about that in a moment. Then Tasmania, a brother Smith from England in 1884. Now, you notice the big gap in the years? So, if you like, down to New South Wales, these dates are reasonably close together. But then we have a big gap of 12, 14 years there to South Australia and another six years to Tasmania. And, he, and went another three years to Western Australia. A brother, Richard Thomas, from Wales. So this was a very slow process. Various individuals in Britain decided to see if they could make a go of it moving to Australia and New Zealand, but there were very few for quite a while. Just a handful of people. Whoop, we've lost our picture again. Earth to Steve, Earth to Steve. No picture. Uh, it's not going to come back this time, is it? Hmm. Still no picture, Steve. Hmm. Okay. I'll start talking and it, hopefully the slide will appear. Oh, there we go. All right. So um, those were people who came to Australia already baptised. So now I've got a, a list I'll go through pretty quickly <coughs> that tells us who the early baptisms were. So these are homegrown, if you like, Christadelphians. The first um, was in New Zealand. If you remember this brother Hayes that I mentioned before? Well, he arrived in 1852. The first person he baptised was 12 years later. So for 12 years he'd been preaching, no results. How would you feel? If you were 
somewhere and preaching for 12 years, would you have given up after 10 or whatever? Who knows? We can't imagine that. So to persevere that long before your first convert was, was an enormous challenge. And this brother learnt from <coughs> Brother Hayes. Brother Hayes by this time had actually moved out of New Zealand, but he'd left uh, books and, and various things. And I you know, had talked to various people and it eventually bore fruit. The second one, only a few months later, was I mentioned earlier about uh, these two brethren in Sydney, Brother William Rook and uh, Brother Kirk. They baptised each other because there wasn't anyone else to do it. The Brother Sinclair who'd come over um, showed them the gospel, but then he'd moved on. And so they thought, well, what are we going to do? There isn't anyone, in, there's no fellow believer around. So they baptised each other one after the other, and hence the first two brethren in New South Wales. In Victoria, uh, there's a fascinating story about this which I can't go into, but there were four men, three of them were in a hospital for people who were, seemed to be permanently disabled, or well, they were assessed as such to begin with. Um, some of them did actually leave the hospital later, but um, not in 100% condition. This is 1873. Now you might not remember what I had up before but this brother Coghill came in 1852. We are 21 years on before there were local homegrown Christadelphians and by this time the name was well circulated. That was in Beechworth as it mentions there and some of us are familiar with that part of the world. Um, Di and I lived in Bright, which isn't too much further away from Beechworth, for uh, th three years, I think it was. And soon after, very soon after, there was um, four of them, two, two couples, by the name of Mitchell and Evans in Warrnambool, and here's John Coghill again. Now, remember how, how long it's been since he arrived He's finally got some converts. That, that's a huge challenge for anyone to imagine, being anywhere and waiting that long before you found another person willing to accept the truth, as we now know. At Queensland, the first baptism there was a sister in Springshaw, which is up near Emerald, 1875. South Australia, familiar name here, Kennet and Jordan in Goo were in 1880. In Tasmania, another 10 years later, before there was a baptism down there, a brother John King in Hobart. And Western Australia, another five years later, before there was one there, and that's Samuel Cochrane at the Bardo Mine, which is out near Kalgoorlie, in the gold mining area. So you can see that it was, on the one hand, slow and very, very small numbers. An incredible test of their faith, of their perseverance. It's a very strong exhortation, in my view, to us today. Now, just to, I will say a bit more about South Australia, because that's where we are. And you may have read about Brother George Murray coming from New Zealand and visiting Goolwa in 1878. And uh, this is a, um, re a statement by um, Sister Jordan, who was previously a Kennet, um, about how, what it was like back in those days. And she described it this way, that this brother Murray inciting discussion on the soul, because the doctrine of the immortal soul is a strong point of the Methodist dogma, so Brother Murray offered to donate 20 pounds, a lot of money then, to any local charity they care to nominate if they could pro provide scriptural proof of that doctrine. Though they failed in their search, it was a turning point in the lives of some of them whose search in due time led them to an understanding of the truth. And so, two years later, William, Mary Ann and Henrietta Kennett, 
and Brother Gilbert Jordan were baptised in Goolwa. So you see, even there, it took two years for them to have got their Bibles out and studied it, compared it with some of the publications that Brother Murray left with them to convince them, and those four were. It was another two years before any more came along. Um, a couple, Ed and Martha Smith, James Mansfield, that makes now a total of seven, they were baptised also in Goolwa. And by 1883, the year after, there were 14 members of the Goolwa Ecclesia, which was a pretty significant number back then. Now, I hope uh, I'm not going to be contradicted here. The best of my knowledge, um, they are the homes of the Kennets and Jordans, respectively. Um, so my sources tell me. And they're still standing in Goolwa today, in Goida Street. Um, by our standards, very, very tiny houses. But uh, that's where I understand they lived. Now, just a little more progression on South Australia. The Adelaide Ecclesia came along another three years later, 1886. And that's familiar to you, I'm sure, because of this poster you've got on the wall in the main hall of the centenary, and it's not coming up yet. Oh, oh, here we go, we've lost it again. I'll keep going. Um, so the Adelaide Ecclesia commenced then on the 5th of December that year, and these were the names... I'll keep going. These were the names of the members at that time. We might get there. Uh, Brown, Mansfield, Fennell, Hopkins, Parsons and Ellis. And then a year later there were some more names coming up. Some of these are of course very familiar. Edgecombe, Cobbledick, Evans, Stevens, Conagrain, Seaman and Young. So the Ecclesia in Adelaide was really starting to move. 1895, it's another eight years along, uh, Brother Robert Roberts visited from Birmingham and uh, he speaks very complimentary about how well laid out Adelaide was at the time, of course, and as a former town planner, I go, absolutely. Um, anyway. Uh, 1892, the summer town Ecclesia started with four members, two couples, and of course you're familiar with the name Cobbledick, and a few years later, in 1896, some more names appear. Broadbridge, again, well known to us here. And they had by then had eight members up there at Summertown. 1893, the Aldgate Ecclesia started with um, Brethren Probert and Lund. Lund is still a name we're familiar with around now. And they moved their location in 1896 to Mylor became the Ecclesia there. Now, I'm uh, interested in, not only in history, but in how the cities, in this case Adelaide, developed. So that was in 1880 when um, the first baptisms occurred down at Goolwa. That was what Adelaide looked like. There was those little black bits is where people had built something. So the city of Adelaide surrounded by the parklands, you might be able to see there well enough. And then a little bit of housing development around it, some out at Port Adelaide, but other than that, just tiny bits, Glenelg, various other dots around a very, very small villages. That's, that's all it was. So to move from Gould to Adelaide, back then, uh, you weren't coming into a big city at all. It was quite a small town, really. But we move on to the early 1900s and it's grown quite a bit. Um, so you've got Mitcham down here, Brighton down there, Henley Beach, um, the land between Port Adelaide and Adelaide's getting pretty well built up. Not much out in the north or northeast, it goes as far as Prospect there. Out here, little bits around Burnside and so on. So, it was starting to grow a, a bit more significantly by 1900. And today, 
by my count, there are 29 ecclesias in South Australia. It's a huge change, isn't it? Um, if you can pick one that I haven't got there, um, let me know. But that's, that's my estimate anyway. That, so there's been a huge growth of Christadelphians in South Australia. And you might say, well, that's probably similar in other states. Well, it probably isn't because I've done a bit of digging. Um, there's the number of Christadelphians in South Australia. In fact, I put it as Adelaide because that's where oh, nearly all of them were. It's, so it's a technically slightly inaccurate, but only slightly. So there were four in 1880. By 1911, there were 309. That's a huge jump, isn't it? By 1961, 1,340 approximately. I haven't been able to find the uh, census figure, but a source I've read says that's about what it was. And the last census, 2,901. And I've compared that with the population of Adelaide at the time and worked out what the percentage of Christadelphians per population is. And you can see that the percentages have significantly increased from the tiny amount at the start to 0.163% up to 227%, 2.23. And you might say, oh, that's not really good. It's, you know, we've stalled. Well, it's not quite right. It, the numbers are right, but it's not as gloomy as it might give you the impression that from the last 50 odd years we've not done anything. It's not quite right. And I'll show you why. But firstly, let's just think about that. Why did it grow so quickly? Well, there was very vigorous preaching. We had large families, um, some extremely large. And if you got a reasonable number of your kids baptised, well, we grew quite significantly without therefore much uh, necessarily from the work of preaching, although that was important as well. And we've had a pretty high retention rate. I've actually uh, talked with um, a guy from the Church of Christ some years back, and they have an appallingly low retention rate. And yet they're probably one of the more popular churches around. I think my, my impression is that of all of the churches around, we probably hold on to our members at least as well, if not better, than any others. And why is that? Well, because we require a substantial Bible knowledge and we're expecting people to lead a conservative lifestyle. I could say relatively conservative compared to most people in society. But that also is, means that our numbers won't ever be significant, really significant, because not many people can be bothered to spend that amount of time on understanding the Bible and furthermore, not many people want to change their lifestyle. Now, why then did I say that's not perhaps as negative as you might have got the impression that our percentage hasn't gone up? Well, first of all, the number of people in society who are Christians has dramatically fallen. So the census in 1966 says that 88% of people in, in Australia were Christian. It's now only 52%. That's a huge drop. So our percentage of the total population, actually, as a percentage of people who say they're Christians, has actually gone up. So we're actually doing rather well in that sense. And you'll see down almost the bottom one, the, the no religion one, back in 1966, less than 1% said they had no religion. Now it's 30% say they have no religion. And another illustration I think is rather telling is this one, that it shows us various groups. Now the blue one down here is the Anglicans as a percentage. That's dropped really very significantly. 
you know, the, the number of Anglicans has clearly plummeted. But the, the one above that, it's interesting it's still showing up because it shouldn't be there, should it? There, yeah, but the, the dip part's on the bottom, so flat on top. <laughs> the old man needs his glasses. Chart's saying, as we'll get to in a moment, is that what I'll call traditional Christian groups have lost numbers enormously. You'll be familiar with the Hyde Park Ecclesial Hall, it used to be a Church of Christ. They just simply ran out of numbers and it was empty for several years until Christadelphians bought the hall. So Many of the Christian denominations have lost numbers dramatically. The interesting one, though, is this middle one. The Catholics have held their own and maybe even slightly increased as a percentage. But when we come to this one up here, the next one, which is the... It's dropped off the picture there, but it's the other Christians. They've dropped down as well. From back here, it's quite a bit less now. The other religions, which is that greeny colour there, slowly increasing, but not a huge amount. But the striped green one up here is the no religion. Look, look at that. From nothing back there, practically, to now being 30%. So there's been an enormous shift in society in Australia to people who say, oh, no, I don't belong to any religion. Which suggests, if that's a th roughly a third, then two-thirds still are. Well, no. They filled in their census saying they were. But if you ask a different question, and it's been done, that maybe people are just filling in what their parents' religion was or what they were as a child, but they don't never, ever go to church. So they put down, oh, well, I was, I'm Church of England, but they only go there for, what, weddings, funerals, and that's about it. Christenings. Christenings, perhaps. Not many do that anymore either. So the question is, well, what do, really, what pe do people really feel? And they've asked the question. <clears throat> so in 2015, a survey, not just in Australia, but the whole world, was taken and found that only 34% of Australians actually felt religious. Doesn't mean they go to church either, but at least they felt religious. So we've gone from two-thirds who said, oh, yeah, I've got a religion, but when you say, do you feel religious, it suddenly goes doom, down to one-third. And it's interesting to look at other countries in this regard. No surprise that only 7% of Chinese people in China think they're religious because it's basically an atheistic country. And so you come down at various countries in Europe down to 23%. But then you come over to more familiar territory. Israel, United Kingdom, New Zealand and Australia are all around the 30-odd figure. That's only... A third of the country is religious now. So if you, if you factor that into those numbers earlier on, our percentage of that number has actually gone up very significantly. So um, that's it, just reference there. One last thing. If you wanted to read a lot more about the history of Christadelphians in Australia, you should get the Lampstand magazine because the, the last two issues, um, I've got articles in there, first of all as an introduction, and then secondly, um, this one is on Victoria. So um, every two months when the magazine comes out, there'll be another part of the, the world being looked at, another part of Australasia, and that'll be a, a total of eight articles. <coughs> 
over every two months, as I said. So that's all. Thank you very much. Hope you found that of some interest. Um, so it's not simply what I was trying to do is say, well, this whole issue of the kingdom is not simply an academic question of what does the Bible teach and what doesn't it, and, you know, we're right, they're wrong kind of attitude. It's more about saying, well, look, this is really important. We've made huge efforts in the past to try and convert some people, and we have significant numbers. Um, I don't know about the rest of you, but Diane's a first-generation Christadelphian. Her, none of her family, slight, even now, not interested in religion. Um, my mother was a first generation. My dad was a second generation. So there's, there's many of us who have come to this understanding in relatively recent times, not because we've had five generations, six generations before us. And we need to try and maintain that spirit of trying to convey to people by any means at all this wonderful hope we've got of the kingdom. When you look around the world, just think about Australia in the last 12 months. Yes, COVID's been a problem, but it's been a problem everywhere. That's not really the issue in my mind. You think of some of the major uproars in our community. Black Lives Matter the Banking Commi Royal Commission. Now we're dealing with treatment of women in, in various organisations. The fabric of our society is not great and we've got the answer. We've got the present hope, the present joy, as well as the future. So hopefully that's been useful in making us just that more a little bit clearer, reminding us of things we've probably known for a long time, and uh, may that continue until our Lord returns. Thank you. <laughs>